discussing the process of protein synthesis, and then um, spend a bit of time discussing uh, protein targeting uh, after proteins are synthesized, as well as uh, some discussion of the way that proteins are degraded, particularly in uh, eukaryotic cells. So to remind you, last time we talked about the basic cycle of translation elongation um, and the steps involved in that in which uh, tRNA uh, charged with an amino acid and bound to elongation factor TU um, is uh, recruited to the ribosome and recognizes the codon and the A site by base pairing. Um, and that uh, base pairing is proofread by uh, EFTU. Um, which hydrolyzes GTP and releases the tRNA into the ribosome in response to a correct pairing between the tRNA anticodon and the codon on the mRNA. Once that accommodation has happened, the ribosome itself catalyzes peptide bond formation uh, in a mechanism that's driven by the uh, RNA content of the large subunit. Um, and following peptidyl transfer, um, another GTPase protein, uh, EFG, um, is responsible for driving the ribosome to translocate exactly three nucleotides um, down the mRNA and maintains a uh, tight base pairing between the tRNAs and the mRNA as it does this. Um, so um, this basic elongation cycle happens, you know, once per amino acid. Um, and sort of a modified version of this cycle happens at the very last uh, codon in order to actually terminate translation. So um, of the 64 codons, three of them are stop codons, and there is no tRNA that recognizes those stop codons. Um, instead, there are protein release factors um, that have roughly the same three-dimensional shape as a tRNA and actually serve as molecular mimics to the tRNA. Um, so this uh, release factor three, for instance, um, has an anticodon-like peptide that recognizes the stop codon through protein-RNA interactions that are specific for uh, the stop codon uh, sequence. Um, there's also a portion of the release factor that mimics EFTU, so this thing drops right into the A site when there's a stop codon present, just like a uh, tRNA with an amino acid and bound by EFTU would slip in. Um, when this release factor uh, enters the A site, um, it can catalyze, using a loop that's uh, out here, um, the hydrolysis of the peptide off of the last uh, uh, tRNA. So instead of a nucleophilic attack by the amine of the next amino acid, of a nucleophilic attack by water that releases the peptide entirely. Um, so at this point, um, the peptide is released with a free C terminus. Um, and there's an additional step after the release of the peptide to fully uh, recycle the ribosome into a state where it's ready to begin the next round of translation. And so some of that is diagrammed here, that these uh, release factors can enter the ribosome and result in peptide of release. Um, and these are also GTP aces. Um, and then there's an additional uh, ribosome recycling factor uh, that binds to the uh, ribosome when there's a, you know, a tRNA in the P site, but no peptide present anymore, and catalyzes a cycle uh, that includes uh, the action of the elongation factor EFG. But instead of causing the ribosome to translocate, this actually causes the two subunits of the ribosome to dissociate entirely. Um, and an initiation factor is actually responsible for then um, so, sort of finishing um, the uh, process of preparing the small subunit of the ribosome for a new round of translation initiation. So um, we're going to discuss uh, translation initiation in somewhat more detail. Um, I think the, the important things to remember about termination are the way that we have these uh, protein factors that mimic the tRNAs and recognize uh, the stop codons in order to release the peptide. Um, and so translation initiation is uh, somewhat, you know, it's a more complicated process and is also uh, different between bacteria and eukaryotes. Um, so a prokaryotic mRNA, like in bacteria, 
um, are polysystronic, meaning that a single mRNA in, can encode multiple proteins. Um, and translation can begin internally, which means the ribosome can hop on right at the beginning of um, each of these proteins to translate specifically that protein. In contrast, essentially all eukaryotic mRNAs are monosystronic, and the translation always begins near the 5' end, and we'll see there are some uh, sort of basic biochemical reasons why it's almost always the first AUG codon on an mRNA that's the site of uh, translation initiation in eukaryotes. Um, and so we'll also see that the molecular factors involved in these are um, actually uh, quite different as well. Um, so in bacteria, um, the small subunit of the ribosome, this is the, in bacteria, this is the 30S subunit. This is the one that, you know, that the mRNA uh, binds to in order to form the, um, uh, you know, the, the decoding center here, um, has what's called a, uh, on the 16S uh, rRNA subunit, uh, there's a sequence called the shine Delgardo sequence. Um, that base pairs directly with the, um, the mRNA. So, so the, the shine delgarno sequence is in the mRNA that base pairs with the anti shine delgarno sequence in the ribosomal RNA. Um, and this is the sort of the interaction that is recruiting the small subunit to the middle of an mRNA. So here it's actually shown happening near the 5' end, but on that polycystronic RNA, each of those separate uh, genes which have its own uh, Schein-Delgarno sequence, and the small subunit of the bacterial ribosome could load uh, directly onto the Schein-Delgarno sequence, whether it's the beginning or in the middle of that transcript. Um, and yeah, so it assembles directly at the start codon in the middle of the mRNA. And here are just some examples of um, some of these uh, Schein-Delgarno sequences. And here is the three prime end of the uh, 16SR RNA. This is the ribosomal RNA component of the small subunit. And you can see how it base pairs with the shine delgarno sequence. And you can, in fact, look at, for instance, this sequence here um, from a uh, bacteriophage gene um, has essentially perfect pairing with this entire uh, region of the ribosomal RNA. So a weaker shine delgarno sequence, like some of these up here that have uh, you know, many uh, places the mismatch against the 6TSR RNA is going to be less effective at recruiting the ribosome. And one of these sequences like this is going to be extremely effective at recruiting the ribosome because it has, uh, in this case, um, nine perfect uh, base pairs. Um, so this interaction um, brings the ribosome near the start codon. Um, and once that happens, um, there is a special uh, initiator tRNA that begins uh, the process of translation. So the small subunit assembles with two initiation factors, IF1 and IF3, um, onto the mRNA. And then this initiator tRNA, whose anticodon is going to recognize an AUG um, start codon. Um, is recruited along with initiation factor 2. So one important thing to remember is that the initiator tRNA enters directly into the P site of the ribosome. So it never enters into the A site. Um, and it's actually brought in at this stage um, when there's only the small subunit, which is how the tRNA can get direct access into the P site of the ribosome. Um, and it's bound here with these initiation factors, and these are going to ensure that there's proper base pairing between this initiator tRNA and the start codon itself. Um, also, the initiator tRNA never interacts with uh, elongation factor uh, TU. And in fact, um, there are one of the, one of the uh, uh, features that distinguishes the initiator tRNA is that it lacks some of the properties of all the elongator tRNAs that allow EFTU to recognize them. So, um, the initiator tRNA recognizes uh, this AUG codon, and in bacteria, it can also recognize a GUG codon. You can see that um, there's actually the potential for this U on the anticodon uh, to recognize either an A or a G of a GUG codon. Um, and um, it's always bound to a uh, methionine uh, here. Um, yes? 
Um, so the significance is just that this is this. Um, so the question is, what's the significance of the fact that uh, the initiator here doesn't interact with EFTU? Um, the answer is that it can't serve as an elongator tRNA. So this is not the tRNA that decodes an AUG methionine codon that shows up in the middle of a protein. It only acts during initiation. Um, and in bacteria, particularly important because it isn't um, charged with uh, a normal uh, methionine. It's actually charged with uh, an formal methionine. Um, and so that uh, chemical modification there um, you can see actually makes uh, the beginning of this protein look like uh, another peptide bond. Like the, so this is the, in red is the formal group, and in purple is highlighted uh, this peptide bond. And by comparison, I've shown the peptide bonds in the middle of an ordinary protein over here, and they're the same structure, the uh, carbonyl group next to the, uh, the secondary amine. Um, so in bacteria, all proteins are going to begin with this uh, N formal methionine that's run in an initiator tRNA and is different than the ordinary methionine that would be present on the elongator methionine tRNA. Um, so um, the initiation factors um, in bacteria uh, sit on the subunit interface of the 30S. So, um, you can you know, see comparing these two diagrams, uh, which are obviously pretty schematic, but are um, you know, pretty representative of the fact that place, places where these protein initiation factors are binding are the same places where the large subunit of the ribosome uh, sits against the small subunit. Um, and so actually, they're incompatible with the presence of the large ribosomal subunit on the RNA. Um, so the final step in translation initiation is uh, GTP hydrolysis by initiation factor two um, in a process that brings in the large subunit and uh, um, attaches it to the small subunit. Um, and when this happens, the uh, initiator tRNA that was um, base paired with the mRNA piece in the small subunit, the, um, the other end of this tRNA enters directly into the P site of the large subunit. Um, and once that happens, this complex is ready for translation elongation. So you have the large and the small subunits joined together. You have a uh, tRNA uh, linked to a growing peptide, which is one amino acid long, that linked to a growing peptide in the P site. And you have a vacant A site that's ready to receive the tRNA uh, corresponding to the second uh, codon on the, uh, on the transcript. So in bacteria, um, transcription, translation, and potentially RNA decay are all coupled processes, by which mean that they, they can actually all, there's no physical separation between them, and they're going to all act simultaneously on a single mRNA. And so you do often see these cases where they have an RNA polymerase that's still synthesizing an RNA at the time that the ribosome is actually loading on to um, you know, the first gene on that transcript and beginning to translate it. And one result of this coupled uh, transcription and translation is that you actually can see these structures where you have, you know, the DNA can have multiple RNA polymerases transcribing it. And the RNA products of each of those RNA polymerases can be um, coded with, in some cases, many uh, ribosomes at once. So um, there's no reason that a single gene can't be transcribed simultaneously by multiple polymerases, and there's no reason that a single transcript can't be translated simultaneously by multiple ribosomes. And that happens um, actually both in eukaryotes and in the prokaryotes. Um, in eukaryotes, um, you don't see, of course, the RNA being transcribed at the same time it's being translated, because in eukaryotes, transcription happens in the nucleus. Uh, whereas translation happens exclusively in the cytoplasm, and so they're separated. Uh, but you do still see these uh, structures called polysomes. So these are um, many uh, ribosomes all translating the same RNA and essentially held together um, by the fact that they're all bound to the same mRNA. Um, so, yeah. 
Yeah, so the, the question is, uh, when I said that a, a bacterial mRNA is polycystronic, does that mean that multiple polymerases can transcribe? It's actually, that isn't the distinction. So polycystronic um, means that a single mRNA has more than one protein coding gene on it. Um, and so that, um, just to uh, sort of flip back, um, that, um, you know, th so this, this whole thing is produced as a single transcript with three different proteins inside it, and each of these are translated independently. For instance, protein 2 ribosomes will um, bind to the Schein-Delgarno sequence right here, translate this protein, and then terminate. Um, and that's relatively independent of, pro of the ribosomes that might be translating protein 3 or protein 1. Um, and you know, if for some reason protein 2 were much more highly translated, you might have, say, multiple ribosomes on protein 2 and none on 1 or 3. Um, so, the, so the question of what, what does polycystronic mean and what does it mean to have, say, multiple ribosomes on the RNA are actually um, somewhat different. So uh, translation initiation in eukaryotes is um, carried out by an almost totally uh, separate uh, and non-homologous uh, set of protein factors that recognize some of the features that are unique to uh, eukaryotic mRNAs. And so two important ones are um, protein factor called EIF4E. So EIF stands for eukaryotic initiation factor. Um, and so these are distinct from the IFs uh, that are present in bacteria. There's IF1, 2, and 3 in bacteria. Um, IF2 is a GTPase that triggers subunit joining. And the IF uh, numbers in bacteria, IF2 for instance, have no relation to the EIF uh, numbers used in eukaryotes. There, there is um, um, sort of no correspondence between those. And so the uh, nomenclature is actually can be somewhat confusing, and I think in, you know, I'll, I'll name a few specific um, eukaryotic initiation factors that I think are um, important to know about, but there, there are actually um, many of these factors, um, there's like EIF3, which turns out actually to be a complex of uh, 12 or 13 individual proteins, and uh, we are going to discuss all of those in detail, um, but I do think it's important to um, know about um, elongation factor, sorry, eukaryotic initiation factor 4E, um, which is also known as the cytoplasmic cat binding protein. And so it specifically recognizes um, that uh, 5 prime to 5 prime linked uh, methyl 7 guanosine cap on the mRNA and binds to it. Um, and at the same time, it's a poly A binding protein, as we discussed before, that binds to the untemplated. Um, poly A tails that are added to the 3' end of each mRNA. So both the beginning and the end of eukaryotic mRNA have special features, and there are proteins that recognize them. And in fact, those proteins are assembled together into a complex uh, by its protein EIF4G. So 4G uh, serves as essentially a scaffold uh, that is going to bring together um, poly A binding protein and the cat binding protein. And so in this way, um, the cell is able to check that the same transcript has both a cap and a poly A tail um, and is actually a transcript that should be translated. Um, and so the assembly of this factor, these factors, um, sometimes referred to as mRNA activation, and the fact that the, uh, the very 3' prime end of the mRNA is bound back near the 5' prime end uh, through these interactions is said to to be that the mRNA is forming into a closed loop. And when you hear people talk about the closed loop, it isn't that there's actually you know, a covalent bond, there's no like phosphodiester bond, it's simply these protein RNA and protein-protein interactions um, bring the two ends of the mRNA back near each other and let the cell sort of check that both the 5' prime and the 3' prime end are good for translation. Um, so these factors assemble on the mRNA. There's also a complex that assembles onto the small subunit of the ribosome. And probably the uh, most important factor there is um, eukaryotic uh, initiation factor 2. It's this EIF2. Um, this uh, binds to the eukaryotic initiator tRNA. So eukaryotes have a special initiator tRNA 
uh, that will interact with uh, EIF2, but not with the eukaryotic elongation factor that would bind to an elongator um, the final tRNA. Um, this tRNA in eukaryotes is charged with an ordinary methionine, not an informal methionine, so the informal methionine is specific to bacteria. Um, EIF2 has a GDP, so it actually has some homology to uh, EFTU or to EF1-alpha. So these are the proteins that bind to elongator tRNAs when they uh, bring them to the ribosome during elongation. So there's actually um, sort of structural homology to this factor that binds to the initiator tRNA in order to uh, bring it to the translation initiation complex. And um, so like uh, EFTU and the EF1-alpha, this is a GTPase that, that uh, binds the GTP and forms something that's called a ternary complex of um, EIF2, GTP, and tRNA. Um, actually, the, the complex is, say, um, EFTU, GTP, and an elongated tRNA is sometimes also referred to as a ternary complex. Um, so uh, this ternary complex assembles with this whole mess of other um, initiation factors onto the small 40S subunit of the ribosome to form something called a 43S pre-initiation complex. Um, and it's this 43S complex that's recruited to um, an activated mRNA. Um, and so th this is shown here that these are the same um, factors of poly-A binding protein 4E in this 4G scaffold um, that interact with this, that interact with the mRNA prior to ribosome recruitment. And this 43S uh, is loaded on, and so because this 4E and 4G are right at the cap, this loading actually happens right at the 5' prime end of the transcript. And that's followed by 5' prime to 3' prime scanning to identify the first AUG on the transcript. Um, and that uh, AUG is recognized by base pairing between the initiator tRNA, its anticodon, and uh, the AUG codon of the, of the RNA. And the, and the scanning process is the reason why eukaryotic translation initiation um, happens specifically at the first AUG codon. So the first time um, this scanning uh, complex encounters a start codon as it moves from the 5' prime end down the RNA, um, will trigger a GTP hydrolysis by eukaryotic initiation factor two, and that um, is sort of a commitment step in translation initiation. Um, so GTP hydrolysis by EIF2 um, is followed by the recruitment of this factor called EIF5B. So this is really the one uh, protein um, in eukaryotic initiation that's related to the bacterial initiation factors that we saw. And it it's corresponds to, it's both homologous to and functionally similar to uh, bacterial uh, initiation factor two. And so like uh, bacterial IF2, it's a GTPase, and its GTP hydrolysis is the last step that triggers subunit joining. Um, so um, all of these uh, initiation factors um, in eukaryotes are also sitting on the subunit interface of the small subunit during scanning. So they essentially all um, need to be displaced um, in order for the large subunit to um, load onto the small subunit. And again, um, the initiator tRNA, um, which is base paired to the mRNA, is delivered directly into the p-site of the large subunit, um, setting up a complex uh, that's um, competent for uh, translation uh, elongation. The, the um, second codon of the transcript is in the a-site, and the first elongator tRNA can come in. So, sort of summarize some of the uh, differences that, that in a prokaryotic mRNA um, the Shine-Milgarno sequence on the mRNA base pairs um, to the small subunit 16SR RNA to allow internal entry. Um, whereas in a eukaryotic mRNA, uh, the ribosome is recruited to the 5' scap, cap and scans downstream to find the first AUG. And the similarities uh, between these two processes are um, that the sort of the final committed step in translation initiation is the joining of the large and the small subunits by um, these homologous factors, IF2 in bacteria, EIF5B in uh, eukaryotic, the GDPase, that when that happens, a special initiator methionyl tRNA base paired 
to the start codon is in the P site. Um, and once that happens, the ribosome is ready to enter uh, the elongation cycle. Um, so it turns out that um, the elongation cycle in particular is the target for a wide variety of uh, drugs uh, that, for instance, uh, kill bacteria by inhibiting protein synthesis of many, many different steps. Um, and I'd like to talk about a couple of these that are sort of mechanistically interesting. Um, uh, but really, each of the steps of this process uh, can be inhibited by drugs, many of which um, are actually things that are used clinically as uh, antibacterial agents, for instance, tetracycline or uh, chloramphenicol. Um, and each of these can sort of inhibit uh, different steps, uh, including the recruitment of the tRNA or its accommodation, peptide bond formation, um, translocation at, in two different ways. Um, and so uh, most of these uh, drugs listed here are uh, specific uh, for prokaryotes or are quite general. Um, but uh, there are actually some uh, drugs that, in, that also are specific for uh, eukaryotic translation. And actually, I have a question about um, one of these is actually this is a bacterial toxin. So the so the um, so question about um, the bacterial toxin diphtheria toxin is actually an enzyme produced by the diphtheria bacterium um, that covalently modifies and inactivates eukaryotic elongation factor two. And the question is, which of these four stages of the elongation cycle do you think will be inhibited um, when this bacterial toxin um, inactivates uh, EEF2? Options that are affecting the tRNA recruitment, the accommodation of the tRNA into the ribosome, the formation of the peptide bond, or the translocation step of the elongation cycle. When you inactivate the elongation cycle, which is a eukaryotic point of PFC. The answer is that the translocation uh, is the step that's going to be inhibited. Um, and the way to think about this is that uh, elongation factor 2, the equivalent of EFG, is this, uh, this uh, protein shown in purple here um, that binds after peptide bond formation and drives translocation in conjunction with GTP hydrolysis. So if you inactivate EFG, you block the translocation step uh, that's catalyzed uh, by you know, the EEF2, the ortholog of EFG, you inhibit the translocation step that it catalyzes. Peptide bond formation is an intrinsic activity of the ribosome itself, um, and the drugs that inhibit um, peptide bond formation actually uh, bind directly to the rRNA in the, um, the peptide transfer center, and tRNA recruitment and accommodation are uh, uh, monitored both by the ribosome itself and also by eukaryotic elongation factor 1, which is the orthologue of uh, EFTU. Um, so one other uh, translation inhibitor that's um, particularly I think, interesting to think about in terms of actually understanding the process of translation is this uh, drug called puramycin, um, which actually um, terminates uh, peptide chains early. So in contrast, to almost all the other drugs, 
it doesn't uh, block the action of the ribosome. Um, it's actually a substrate mimic for the ribosome. You can see um, some of these features here. That, so this, um, in this big red oval, is pure mycin. Um, and so this, look, this region here sort of looks like a, um, a tyrosine. It actually has an O-methyl group here. But this essentially looks like a tyrosine. This looks like um, an adenine um, here. Um, the uh, this sort of uh, n 6 methyl adenine here with the ribose here. Um, and remember the last um, nucleotide in the tRNA, the one that's actually directly linked to the amino acid, is always an adenine. And so this actually fits right into the peptide transfer center of the ribosome. And the free amine um, uh, attacks the um, uh, the growing peptide chain, so the peptide chain is transferred onto pyramycin. Because pyramycin ends right here. It doesn't have a whole tRNA down here. Um, and so what happens when the ribosome transfers the growing peptide onto um, pyramycin in the A site, that um, there's no longer anything holding um, the peptide in the ribosome. And so actually this is sort of a mimic of the translation termination process in that the ribosome transfers a growing peptide onto this small molecule without a tRNA in the A site. So this causes premature termination and the pure mycin is actually physically stuck on to um, the growing end of the peptide chain. Um, so I think another interesting class of translation inhibitors don't directly affect any of the sort of catalytic uh, parts of the ribosome. These are um, macrolide antibiotics, these um, erythromycin is one example of these. And um, this is um, sort of a nice introduction to thinking about the fate of the protein that's being synthesized by the ribosome. So this is sort of a cross-section of the large subunit of the ribosome. And you can see that there's an exit tunnel um, that the unstructured linear polypeptide threads its way out. So it's about 30 amino acids long. Um, here, and you can see that it's still linked to the uh, P site tRNA as it's growing. Um, and so these 30 amino acids are actually still buried inside the ribosome in a, in a tunnel basically only wide enough for a, you know, an unstructured protein to thread through. Um, and after that, it actually emerges from the ribosome uh, into the cytoplasm. And macrolide antibiotics actually fit into that ex exit tunnel and dock in a very specific way that blocks uh, the growing peptide chain uh, from escaping it. Um, and interestingly, one um, uh, way that um, bacteria can make a translation of certain proteins resistant to these macrolides is, a, is to have a um, special sequence at the beginning that's very good at displacing this antibiotic out of the, uh, out of the exit tunnel. And so bacteria that are resistant to these things um, can essentially push them out um, using a peptide sequence since it's the beginning of some of the proteins involved in detoxifying them. Um, so uh, this, uh, for many uh, proteins, there's soluble protein, proteins in eukaryotes that are going to go to the nucleus and so forth, um, the peptide is going to emerge straight from the ribosome and free into the cytoplasm. It may interact with protein folding chaperones and so forth. Um, but for proteins that are destined to be uh, secreted or um, proteins that are um, integral membrane proteins, um, they actually have a different fate in this um, process of protein translocation. Um, and so um, this is sort of diagrammed here where the um, ribosome, which is always in the cytosol, um, can dock up against a translocon channel in the membrane. So eukaryotes, um, this membrane is going to be the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum. And you can um, see in this electron micrograph um, all of these little beads um, sort of docked up against this thin black line. Those are ribosomes docked up against the ER, um, sending their proteins uh, directly through the membrane as they're being produced. Uh, in bacteria, uh, this would be the inner membrane, and the proteins would be emerging into the periplasmic space. So, um, the nascent peptides, the protein that's destined to be secreted or to be embedded in the membrane, are never uh, directly exposed to the cytosol. Um, 
And so these proteins that are destined for secretion start with an amino terminal signal sequence. And so this is a peptide sequence um, that uh, marks them uh, to be translocated. Um, so as the ribosome is translating, uh, of course, at first, it's translating with first, say, 30 amino acids. And all of this um, growing protein is still buried inside the ribosome. But after it gets uh, 50 to 60 amino acids in, um, the beginning of the protein starts to emerge into the cytoplasm. And at that point, an RNA protein complex called the signal recognition particle uh, will bind to this signal sequence. So the signal sequence has to extend beyond this 30 amino acid exit tunnel before this signal recognition particle can find it. And there's, actually, there's one specific protein, SRP54, that's responsible for binding to the, the signal sequence itself, as well as an RNA scaffold that brings together this and several other components. Um, so the signal sequence um, is a peptide motif that's so in the protein, sort of encoded in the RNA, but the, the direct uh, recognition is of the protein that's being synthesized. And it's pretty simple. It needs a basic uh, residue, one to two basic residues at the beginning, and then 10 to 15 hydrophobic uh, residues. And here are some examples of the um, signal sequences from a number of uh, well-characterized proteins. Um, and these signal sequences are actually cleaved off as the, as the protein is being translocated. And there's a cleavage site here. It's typically near glycine and alanine residues just downstream of the signal sequence. So um, this is why, um, for instance, uh, you know, human pre-pro-insulin is called pre-pro-insulin in part because um, the protein as synthesized by the ribosome is bigger than the final protein and, and part of it is because a signal sequence is cleaved off. There are also additional cleavages in the case of insulin. Um, and in order to ensure that uh, these proteins destined for secretion are not um, exposed to the cytosol, uh, the SRP can actually stall <laughs> translation until it binds to its receptor on the membrane. Um, so um, here, the ER lumen would be a similar um, idea for uh, the bacterial inner membrane, has um, a receptor for SRP as well as this uh, tra translocation complex of the translocon channel. And after the signal sequence emerges and SRP binds, it stalls the ribosome in this state until uh, it docks on to this channel. Um, and both SRP as well as the SRP receptor are GTPases, and they both hydrolyze GTP in response to the direct addition event to open uh, the translocon channel. The protein is going to thread through directly out of the ribosome and into the ER. Um, this protein inside the ER called the signal peptidase will cleave off that signal sequence um, resulting and before the protein is fully synthesized, um, leaving behind the, the process form of the protein inside the ER. Um, and I think one important note about this is there is no special pool of membrane-bound ribosomes that when the ribosome is done translating, the only thing holding it on to the membrane is this protein that's coming out of the ribosome and into the translocon channel. And when that terminates, the ribosome is released to go translate another message. Um, and the way that a ribosome is recruited to the ER is based on the protein that it's producing. So that protein that it's synthesizing has a signal sequence. It's recognized uh, by the SRP. Both the ribosome and the SRP are soluble factors present in the cytoplasm. Um, and this uh, ribosome SRP complex um, on the signal sequence um, is brought to the SRP receptor and the translocon channel, which are both transmembrane proteins um, here present on the ER, causing the structure that dots together and explains why we could see all those little ribosomes sitting along uh, the ER membrane sort of dot directly there in a, actually what we now know is an extremely specific configuration with the exit tunnel and the translocon directly um, next to each other. Um, so um, this is uh, definitely the, the best understood example of uh, protein translocation. So there are other uh, membrane-bound organelles uh, in cells, uh, including the mitochondria and, and the chloroplast. And in both of those cases, we know that cytosolically translated proteins end up in that organelle. 
Um, but the mechanism is uh, much less well understood. Um, so I'd like to finish um, by talking uh, briefly about the degradation of proteins, particularly in eukaryotes. Um, and a large fraction of eukaryotic protein degradation is carried out by a complex called the proteasome. Uh, so this is a large complex. It's 26 S. So again, these are um, sort of a size unit is measured by um, how it sediments during ultracentrifugation. So 26 S means that it is um, you know, not quite as large as a small ribosomal subunit, but still quite large. Um, and we understand the structure pretty well. Um, and it's sort of shown in sort of atomic resolution here, and schematically here. And the proteasome has called the 20 S core. Um, that is a, sort of a seven member, a stack of uh, seven member rings. Um, and right in the core are these beta subunits, which are proteases with a, a few different proteases with different specificities. And these proteases themselves are always active. Um, and the alpha subunits sitting here actually control access of substrates to uh, these proteases inside the proteasome. Um, and so this whole thing is symmetric, and there are sort of two ways the proteins can enter. This is drawn here. It's either from the top or the bottom, of the, but it's totally symmetric. And there's a separate, um, you know, outside the core, there's a separate regulatory particle that sits on top of it, recognizes substrates, un unfolds them, and threads them into uh, the core of the proteasome for degradation. And so a bit of that is shown here. That, so this is showing a, a cross-section of that 20S core, the active sites buried right in the middle here. Um, and then the alpha ring up here has um, some specific regions that serve as a gate that block entry into the core. And if you isolate just the core of the proteasome, the alpha and beta subunits of no regulatory particle, the default state of the alpha subunits is to close that core entirely. So this thing has these very active proteases in the middle, but no proteins will ever get into them. Um, the alpha subunits will, will open up a small um, pore uh, when the 19S regulatory particle docks onto them. Um, this is actually still a quite narrow pore in, so actually only an unstructured uh, protein can actually thread into this pore to be degraded. Um, and so the... Um, so this 19S regulatory particle then is what's actually responsible for picking which proteins are going to be degraded uh, by the cell in the proteasome. Um, and in specific, it recognizes uh, proteins that have been linked um, with this uh, post-translational modification, ubiquitolation. Um, it unfolds them, um, threads them in the core, and so this uh, polyubiquitin chain is shown with these, these red dots here. Um, that the regulatory and then this regulatory particle that has um, ATPases that unfold proteins and are actually um, similar to some of the enzymes involved in bacterial protein degradation, but in this case they're simply unfolding the protein and threading it into this the very active uh, proteases present in the core. So um, it's this process of ubiquitination uh, that's really going to determine uh, which proteins are degraded and. Um, and so I'd like to take a moment to introduce uh, ubiquitin. So this is a, a small, it's a 76 amino acid protein. Its structure is shown here. It has an almost invariant sequence in all eukaryotes. Um, and it's highly abundant and is present in genes in multiple copies in the cell and actually also present in sort of tandem arrays that are cut up into individual ubiquitin molecules. And the way ubiquitin is attached to a protein um, is through it's called an isopeptide bond, um, which is just like an ordinary peptide bond, except the linkage is from the amine at the, uh, the end of the lysine side chain to the C-terminal glycine in ubiquitin. So here I've shown this is a peptide bond in the ordinary backbone of whatever substrate protein you're looking at. And in particular, this is a lysine residue that extends up here and has a primary amine. Um, and that amine, um, can link to uh, the carboxylic acid at the C terminus of ubiquitin using exactly the same kind of linkage as we see in the protein backbone, both of the substrate protein 
and also of ubiquitin. Um, and so this conjugation of uh, ubiquitin to, the, to a lysine in a protein uh, happens um, uh, under in, in a number of different um, situations. And when it's going to mark proteins for degradation, it's actually not just a linkage of a single ubiquitin to that protein. So ubiquitin itself contains a number of lysine residues. Uh, these are all shown in orange here. And the one we care about most is lysine 48. Um, and what can actually happen is that a second ubiquitin, C-terminus, can be linked to lysine 48 on the first ubiquitin and, and so forth. And so the actual signal uh, for degradation by the proteasome is a chain of about four of these uh, ubiquitins, each linked together. So the first ubiquitin, C-terminus, is linked to a lysine in the substrate protein. A second ubiquitin is linked to lysine 48 in the first ubiquitin, and so forth. And this four uh, ubiquitin, four K48 uh, ubiquitins together um, are the signal is recognized by the proteasome to um, open that 19S regulatory particle unwind uh, the protein that's been ubiquitinated and thread it into that pore to be degraded. So uh, the process of ubiquitination um, is carried out by uh, an enzyme cascade um, that's going to form uh, this isopeptide bond. Uh, the first step is this ubiquitin activating enzyme, or an E1 enzyme. And so it uses the energy of ATP hydrolysis um, to make a high energy thioester linkage of the ubiquitin C terminus onto uh, cysteine residue in the E1 enzyme itself. So this sulfur is coming from a cysteine in the E1 enzyme itself, and this thioester linkage is sort of like uh, the linkage that you might see in, for instance, acetyl CoA. Um, and so this, you know, this, this activation is the use of ATP to take the carboxylic acid. Um, on the, you know, the end of ubiquitin itself and turn it into this high energy bond. And once that happens, it actually hands off the ubiquitin to a ubiquitin conjugating enzyme, which is called an E2 enzyme. So the thioester is transferred from the cysteine of the E1 enzyme to a cysteine of the E2 enzyme. Um, and this E2 is actually going to catalyze the transfer of that ubiquitin, that ubiquitin thioester, onto the primary amine of a lysine in the target protein. Um, and so the E2 enzyme, of which there are about 35 in humans, um, is actually going to control the nature of the polyubiquitin chain that might be formed. So some E2 enzymes um, simply won't make polyubiquitin chains to simply put on one ubiquitin. Um, others will make chains of you know, many uh, ubiquitins all linked at, C at uh, K48 and others will link um, ubiquitin chains to other lysines that aren't going to target a protein for degradation. So the E2 enzyme is what's controlling the kind of chain that's made. And then there's a third protein involved called the ubiquitin ligase E3 that actually bridges from the E2 to the specific protein substrate that's going to be targeted. So the E3 um, gives a specificity to the target protein and is usually very tightly regulated in its activity E3 does not directly have any enzymatic role. It simply brings together the E2 enzyme charged with ubiquitin to the target protein, which can then transfer um, the, uh, the ubiquitin onto it. Um, and so there are uh, at least 600 E3 enzymes that are known in human cells. So it's a, a huge family of proteins um, that uh, is responsible for uh, a wide variety of different uh, regulations. Some of that is regulated protein destruction, where an E3 enzyme um, can be activated under certain conditions um, to bring together its cognate E2 with a target protein to mark it uh, for degradation by the um, so, uh, so that's what I wanted to talk about.